meet Salima. Salima is living in a village. Her family is struggling to get by. And one day, her aunt came over to say, I will be able to get you a job in a factory in Dhaka. Several weeks later, the aunt came again by the house with an individual that she introduced as the factory recruiter and encouraged Salima to go to Dhaka with this guy. She trusted her aunt, and why wouldn't she? And she leaves the village to go to Dhaka. And fortunately, when she arrives in Dhaka, she's being sold in a brothel in Mirpur. Meet Anar, Munir, and Putul. They were really keen to find a job to work overseas. So they discussed with the Dalal in the village, and he arranged for them to go to Qatar using his connections. What happened when they arrived in the destination country in uh, Qatar, in Doha? They were taken to a labor camp. Their passports were taken away. They were forced to, to work over 12 hours a day with very little food. This went on for over a year. So what is human trafficking? I am pretty sure that all of you came across this term, either trafficking in persons, either human trafficking, or either modern slavery. It can take many forms forced labor, sexual exploitation, but also domestic servitude, the bondage, um, child marriage, forced marriage, and removal of organs. It was firstly defined in the international legislation under the protocol to suppress, to prevent, suppress, and punish uh, trafficking in persons especially women and children, better known as the Palermo Protocol. Today, I choose to focus on prosecution, to talk about prosecution in human trafficking cases. The reason I choose this topic is because it seems to me that lately, the prosecution have taken a seat back in the anti-trafficking intervention. Prevention, protection, even social uh, economical intervention seem to be more central to the um, uh, combating human trafficking, while prosecution is something that is left to the state. But what I want to tell you today, that the prevention and protection are very closely entwined with prosecution, and without the prosecution, they are being mean meaningless. Before I move forward to make my point, let me give you an idea about what are we facing. And let me start with the trafficking myth or misconception. Most of the people, when they talk about human trafficking, they have several ideas. One of them is that only women and children are being trafficked. This is not the case. Over 60% of the people being trafficked are male. Human trafficking is sex trafficking. This is not the case again. Only 20% of the people trafficked are actually sexually exploit exploited. Although we agree that they deserve our attention, there are 68% which are trafficked for forced labor. Human trafficking, the same thing as human smuggling. No. Human smuggling, it's a crime committed against the border of a country. Human trafficking, always a crime committed against a person. So I'll let you read this part, and I would just conclude in this. No victim can consent to his or her own exploitation. So let me talk about how big the business of human trafficking is. 150 billion yearly, 
is the profit, according to ILO. By contrast, the funding for the organization finding, fighting to combat human trafficking is 350 million. I think that it's 0.2% of something. Again, 45 point million people are being trafficked. And 58% of those are in five Asian countries. This morning, we all heard Faisal's presentation about how good and how well the population helped the growth of Bangladesh. I will show you the other side. 1% of the Bangladeshi are, in, are trafficked either in, within the country, or outside of the country. To combat human trafficking, in 2012, a new law was um, adopted. It's called Prevention and Suppression of Human Trafficking. And let me tell you, it is a very good law. I've been working international, and I've seen several laws in lots of countries, and this is one of the best that I have seen. It's not only has provision about the investigation, prosecution, trial, but it's also very important, looks at the um, victim protection and support. However, there is a problem. The rules of implementation were adopted only in January 2017. That means that there was a gap of five years where the law was left to the individual interpretation of criminal justice sector, which went to be quite a, tr a problem in terms of the prosecutions. And I will show you why. Here we have the victims identified, number of person arrests, and number of person convicted. 2015, 2016, 2017. Look at the difference between the numbers. We have thousands of people arrested and only four, three, and one convicted. So why is this happening? Based on my experience, as a police officer working specifically in trafficking investigation, but also considering that within the last three years, I have been working very closely with the um, criminal justice sector in Bangladesh. I've learned the following. The police do not recognize the crime of trafficking and does not, do not identify the victim as such. Or when they do, they keep on taking statements over longer periods of time, and they create a secondary victimization of the person which were trafficked. Another reason is the lack of access to evidence because the crime was committed on the, uh, on the destination countries. I am pretty sure that you are familiar with a dictum called justice a delay, justice denied. Lots of trials take a such a long amount of time that victims are settling out with the traffickers outside of the court. In this example, I have, we were following closely over 181 cases, and out of these 100 were settled outside of court. Most important reason was the length of the trial procedure. Another reason, lack of police prosecution cooperation. Family pressure, not to press accusations against the trafficking, traffickers if they are part of your family. Also, you know, they are really concerned about the stigma and, of course, corruption in the criminal justice system. Meet Salima again. Salima wanted to file a case against her aunt. Her family pressured her 
not to because they did not want to lose face and they were also very concerned about the prospective of marriage of the other girls in the family if the community will find out what happened to Salima. What happened? They managed to break free of the camp and they found the Bangladeshi embassy. They requested to be repatriated and they were sent back to Bangladesh after one year of hard work with nothing. They filed a case against the Dalal. The Dalal was arrested and later on released in bail. He's continuing what he's doing before and he reminds them all the time that they cannot do anything against him. So this is what I want to talk about the connection between prosecution and prevention. It doesn't matter how many times we send out prevention messages if the victims, if the community keep on seeing traffickers doing whatever they are doing with impunity and there are no consequences for their actions. And let me talk about the protection side. There is no protection for the victims if it's no justice. It doesn't matter that we help the victim, you know, to get access to support, to shelter, to food, to medical, but if they don't get justice. I will tell you what one victim said to me. I want him to go to jail for what he did to me. He deserved to be in jail for what I got through. There is no protection for victim if there is no justice. So you might wonder, what is the solution? There are very easy action that they can be taking. Like for example, you speedy trial. Bangladesh has a very clear procedure of how to use speedy, uh, speedy trial. Use it for human trafficking cases. Create an anti-trafficking um, task force, which brings together prosecutors and police. They will work together. Also, ensure that the victims have not only um, access to support, but also when a conviction is being uh, finalized, there is also financial compensation for the victims. And one of the most important things protect them from intimidation. Allowed me to finish this talk by telling you that trafficking is everywhere around us. And it's also based on demand. Demand for cheap labor, demand for pro cheap products, for domestic help, for organs, for sexual services. You and you and you, myself included, we are all complicit to this. Look around you, and I'm pretty sure that if we look even around this building, 500 meters, we will be able to find people which are being enslaved or in trafficking situation. What I will hope that you live here with a new vision and you will be able to look around you and recognize the cases. Maybe this is happening even in your house or even into your friend's house. If you notice, report it. Go to the police, go to the NGOs. Do not deny someone's tomorrow while you are sitting there and contemplate yours. Thank you very much. <laughs>